All right. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm in DC. I think most of everybody here knows me. I'm Teresa. I'm our Director of Communications and Organizing for IMALS. Um, thank you for coming. It's our first research update and community conversation. Um, as you know, just last year around this time, we gave IMALS's first round of research grants. I wanted to let everybody know we're planning, we are recording this um, and we're gonna share it out to the community for those who couldn't make it. So just a heads up that we are indeed recording. Um, so we're hosting this community conversation for two reasons. At IMALS, we're about being accountable. We wanna um, make sure that we're sharing back to the community how we're spending our research dollars. The research dollars come from unsolicited donations from the community and it's important that we're transparent and accountable there. Um, and we also want to give the people that we awarded these grants to a chance to update on their research progress and allow you guys to come and ask questions. Um, most of you are already experts in this field, but it's important to understand the different projects that are happening. So today, we're welcoming Dr. Sabrina Paganoni. You guys all know her well. I'm going to take a moment to read a little bit about her. She's an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School and a physical scientist at the Healy Center for ALS at Massachusetts General Hospital. Her research focuses on clinical trials and therapy development for ALS. And she has served as a principal investigator on several ALS clinical trials and is really leading the field in using novel trial design endpoints and digital tools to improve the way ALS trials are conducted. Specifically for today, IMALS last year awarded Dr. Pagago and her team $200,000 to support an expanded access program for, for Dipistat. Um, she's going to give you the details on that in just a moment, but we created a video about the grant. We wanted to share it with you guys just to give a little refresher. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Am I sharing? No. Hang on just a little. Let's start here. What is a platform trial? So happy you asked. A platform trial tests several drugs at the same time. It means researchers can test multiple treatments at once, decrease the trial time, increase patient participation, and reduce the cost and time of research. The Healy ALS platform trial is the first time a platform trial has been tried in ALS. The end goal remains quickly and efficiently evaluate promising therapies and move them forward to reduce the impact of ALS. There has been a resounding response from people living with ALS willing to participate, enrolling in record numbers. Unfortunately, not everyone can get into the trial. This is where IMALS and this grant come in. IMALS, through a $200,000 research grant, will enable one of the platform trial drugs, Biohavens for Dipistat, to be offered through expanded access to 35 patients with ALS. These patients are not eligible to participate in the trial and would not have received this therapy otherwise. Like all clinical research with new treatments, FDA and ethics board approvals are required prior to the first person enrolling. These patients will receive the drug for a period of 12 months at three participating sites. This expanded access program is being set up to be completed at multiple sites, which means easier and cheaper expansion beyond this program. And a bonus, like all other parts of the Healy Platform trial, the research team of Drs. Paganoni, Sudkovich, and Bedlack are sharing the learnings, how it was built, pitfalls, successes, so that other trials can do the same. That means the impact can be leveraged beyond this trial. The expanded access program that IMALS is funding will be offered at three of the 54 trial sites, but the project could be a stepping stone for creating a larger expanded access program for the platform trial throughout the United States. 
Healy is open to expanding those locations with expanded access in the future. This means more access for more patients with ALS who need critical therapies and treatments now. Okay, um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Paganoni. I did want to note that this is a community conversation, so if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, drop it in the chat, or signal us in some other way. Um, but without further ado, off to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Teresa, and thank you, everyone. Um, I see a raised hand to start. Uh, Mary, do you have a question? Hi, can you hear me, Mary? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a uh, question. Um, with Trump's right to try bill law, that that creates a parallel pathway where you don't have to go through FDA and the FDA Ethics Committee. So I was wondering if we could not waste that time. <laughs> okay, so let me maybe go to the presentation since um, um, I guess we, we were gonna you know, provide updates on the grant uh, and the program, and then maybe I can touch on that as I go through the slides, if that's okay. okay. Uh, and then we, we go back. And, and as people have other questions, feel, feel, feel free to put them in the chat. I promise I have a short deck. I don't want to give it like a one hour lecture. So I'll get to your question soon. I only have 15 slides. I just wanted to sort of expand on the video so that people know what we've been working on over the last year. Uh, and and I, I guess um, we can discuss uh, options and other opportunities. So I'm gonna share this screen. And, and really the goal here is to ignite an EAP movement for ALS. And by EAP, I mean uh, expanded access program or expanded access protocol. And this is very much a collaborative effort. So we are uh, working on this from the Healy Center, Healy and EMG Center for ALS and Mass General in collaboration with many colleagues from the Northeast ALS Consortium. We're very grateful to IM ALS for the grant. And we also work uh, with Duke University as I will explain in a second. Uh, I'm presenting today, but as always, uh, all of these programs are uh, a partnership with many other um, groups uh, and individuals that participate Participate. And I want to acknowledge the role of Dr. Mary Sukovic, who is the director of the Healy Center, uh, for really starting uh, to work on EAPs in 2018 based on uh, recommendations from patients who were very interested in this um, paradigm, uh, as well as Dr. Bedak from Duke, who is uh, leading some of our um, educational materials that I will discuss uh, today. So I, I just want to take a step back and maybe that's also helpful to start addressing your question. Uh, and I'll go back to that later, but where we are now is the, is the following. So what we really want to have is approved medicines for everyone. Uh, when a drug is approved, for example, Riluzol or Radicava or, or Nodexta for ALS or other drugs for other diseases, then we have the broadest access. Meaning that if a drug has gone through testing, and it's finally approved by the FDA, uh, that means that it has undergone a strict process uh, where the safety and efficacy of the drug, the medicine, has been confirmed uh, generally more than once by different groups. Uh, and at that point, the drug is approved. There's an approved medicine, and people can access that through prescription. Um, and, and hopefully, insurance will uh, will cover it, which obviously is a, is a separate topic. But again, the, the, that's the way to get the broadest access to drugs for people living with a specific disease. Now, how do we get to approved medicines? Where well, there is a process called clinical trials. Clinical trials are the only way to evaluate the safety and efficacy of new medicines or investigational products. In other words, that's the only path to be able to tell if a drug is safe and effective. And that's important because we want to make sure that people have access, but also have access to drugs that help them. And so that's how the clinical trial um, sort of landscape uh, functions to be able to support the approval of new medicines. Now, the problem is that not everyone can participate in clinical trials. And there are some complex reasons for that. Uh, it's mostly a statistical concern. When you have a disease that's variable, like ALS, as you know, it can be very different from person to person. In order to have trials that can have positive outcomes and can be conducted in a relatively short period of time, uh, unfortunately, uh, from a statistical perspective, 
only people with certain characteristics can enroll. Now we are all advocating to make the trials as broadly accessible as possible. And there are new, uh, that's actually my area of research to, to develop new designs that are more, um, more accessible uh, and more efficient. For example, the Healy ALS platform trial is one example of a trial that has more efficiencies than traditional trials. However, even in, in that context, not everyone can participate because participants need to have certain characteristics in order to be able uh, for the statisticians to detect a positive effect if one exists. That, that's a problem though, because that means not everyone can participate in a clinical trial. And certainly we want to have more people living with ALS get access to investigational products. Now that's possible under the FDA uh, using the so-called concept of expanded access or EAPs for short. Um, there's different acronyms, expanded access protocols, ex expanded access programs. But essentially when we mean, when we say EAPs, we mean options for people who are not eligible for clinical trials to get access to the investigational product. The primary goal again is access, is not testing the drug. If you look at the entire population, obviously it's important to test the drugs, but then if you're not eligible for clinical trials, then what, what, what's left? Well expanded access are a way to fill that gap and respond to the need for access for people who want to participate uh, and have access um, in a, to an investigational product. Now, the FDA has different pathways for expanded access to happen. It can be done at a single patient level, meaning there is an individual, uh, one person living with ALS or, or, or with a different disease that works with their physician to request access just for that one person. So you do the, the sort of the, you, you ask for all the permissions for that single person to have access. And then there are protocols, and that's what we're talking about here, that can be intermediate size or a little bit bigger, where uh, a physician uh, in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company and in collaboration with other stakeholders requests the FDA permission to have a protocol where we can actually give access to the drug, not just to one person, but to a group of people. Now, the size of the group, we'll discuss there, that, you know, there's different uh, considerations there, but essentially if there's funding and if there's uh, the resources, the, the human resources to be able to, to do that, we can give access to small groups of people and hopefully over time, more, you know, more people as part of this expanded access program. And I do want to point out that that's, the population or the people who participate in expanded access are very different from people who participate in clinical trials, because again, there's almost two parallel tracks and both are important. Now, at this stage, where we are is that uh, only about 10% of people with ALS participate in research or clinical trials. Certainly, uh, that's something that we're not happy with, uh, that we want to change. And that's where the, the grant is, uh, is started helping us to achieve our goal. Our goal is really to be in a situation where the vast majority of people uh, participate in research if they want to. There might be people who don't want to, and, and that's perfectly fine. But we want to give everyone the options so, so that everyone who's interested can actually participate either in clinical trials if they're eligible or in expanded access if they're not eligible for a, for a formal trial. Now, I do want to mention uh, that at the Healy Center, we started working on uh, EAPs or expanded access programs since 2018. And the poster is from a recent presentation at the International uh, ALS MD Symposium happened last week. And so as you can see uh, in the graph, starting in 2018, uh, we've been enrolling a number of people in our program at the Healy Center under the leadership of Dr. Sukovic. And really that was um, you know, a, a great partnership with patients who have been asking for access uh, to, um, to investigational products. And all of this has been funded by philanthropy so that you know, there could be groups of people, uh, not just individuals, but groups of people who could have access to drugs, uh, different drugs donated by different companies. Uh, and the program has been um, growing over time since 2018. And uh, however, uh, this program was only available at our site. So we would enroll patients from our clinic uh, as an expansion of clinical care. Essentially, if you, you know, come to, uh, to our clinic, uh, you, know, you can become a patient so we can prescribe, for example, Riluzol or Radicav or Nudexa or other drugs. And then as an expansion to the clinical care, 
uh, small groups of, of individuals were um, were given access uh, or are still given access to investigational treatments, very uh, several of them um, uh, for, for ALS. Uh, but we wanted to, to make that available at other sites as well. We wanted to uh, make sure that this paradigm that we uh, that it's been working so well in our clinic could also be replicated in other areas. And that's where the grant came in because we really wanted to expand this from our, cent from our own center to other centers. And so this has been a great partnership again uh, at the Healy Center with Duke University and thanks to funding from IMALS and, and also donation of drug uh, from one of the companies that we work with. And, and the goals of the program are, are, are twofold. Number one, we wanted to give access to a specific drug to an intermediate sized group of uh, patients with ALS. That's the first goal. Again, uh, the primary goal of all EAPs is access. But we also wanted to develop a series of materials tools that would be helpful both for, uh, to the patient community in terms of learning more about EAPs and what they are, but also to other researchers, other sites, uh, companies, providers, people uh, who may want to replicate this type of model at other sites. So uh, basically we, we wanted to give access and at the same time, learn from this experience and make all our tools available freely to others so that they can also open their own EAPs. So that's exactly the goal of the trial. The video described, or the EAP, the, the, the video described the grant and specifically how IMALS helped us catalyze this intermediate size EAP for ALS with your deeper start. This is a companion to the platform trial. I spoke briefly earlier about the platform trial. That's a large scale trial that's going on in multiple centers in the US. Uh, that's a, a trial that's more efficient than traditional trials, uh, but it's, and it's broad, more broad broadly available to patients compared to a traditional trial. But nevertheless, uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, not everyone can participate. So we wanted to create a parallel uh, path for people who cannot participate in the platform trial itself to have access to uh, at least this one drug to start. And then I'll tell you more uh, about other drugs. But, but essentially, we started uh, with, with this one drug, thanks to the grant from IMALS, Biohaven donated the drug uh, and matched the grant, uh, and we work in close collaboration with them to monitor the safety of all participants. So I am the principal investigator of this program, and I hold the IND. That means that I'm responsible to the FDA for this program, and I work closely with Dr. Grossman from Biohaven, who serves as the medical monitor. So essentially, one might, um, might think that uh, providing an EAP is as simple as providing a prescription. Unfortunately, that's not the case because these are still investigational products and we are responsible for monitoring the safety of the product in all the participants. And that's why we work closely uh, with the medical monitor. And we have a few members of our team are actually on the call today. We have a project management team. I would like to acknowledge all their work uh, because really they keep um, the entire program up and running so that we can safely uh, provide access uh, to the drug to people living with ALS. Now, the drug itself was donated by Biohaven. I know this is a little bit of a busy slide, but just to recap why we are uh, we're interested in, in, in the deeper stat. This is still an investigational product. We don't know if it works for ALS or not. We're testing whether it works or not in the platform trial, and we're giving access to more people as part of the EAP. This is a drug uh, that it's a, a myeloperoxidase inhibitor. What that means is that it lowers neuroinflammation in the brain, and where neuroinflammation is essentially driven by my microglia, which are a type of inflammatory cells that reside in the brain. And we do have imaging data from Parkinson's disease and other, um, other uh, disease areas where the drug was shown to lower neuroinflammation in the brain. And many of you who follow ALS research, uh, you may know that there's a lot of interest in neuroinflammation. And again, uh, the, the idea is if, if we could find drugs that can selectively lower neuroinflammation in the right spot in the brain, that could help people with ALS. Again, we are testing that in the context of the platform trial. Uh, and so um, next year, we will be able to tell if the drug is effective for ALS as part of the formal trial. And that will have implications, obviously, for, for everyone. In the meantime, we're giving access to the deeper start to people who do not qualify for the platform trial itself. The sample size is 35 participants, uh, meaning that we had the resources, drug, and funding to, to this um, intermediate uh, size uh, group. 
35 people at three clinical sites. Uh, and obviously we hope to expand in the future. The three sites are MGH, Northwestern and Duke. So we started to expand beyond our own center. As I mentioned earlier, we had previous great experiences with uh, EAPs at our own site, but we wanted to, uh, to partner with other colleagues who were also interested in offering EAPs to their patients. And so we partnered uh, with Northwestern and Duke. Uh, and, and this is a companion to the HILI ALS platform trial. I want to mention that all these three sites are also active in the platform trial itself and, and offer this additional option. Now, I, I told you earlier that the primary goal is access, but we really want to learn from this experience and share all our learnings with everyone. So in collaboration with the NEILS Consortium and Duke University, we are creating a web page on the NEILS website, which, uh, which will be freely available to offer educational materials, advocacy materials, more training resources. We already wrote a, a chapter, book chapter with Dr. Bedlack and Dr. Sukovic and a few other colleagues. Uh, and this is just the first step. Really, the idea is to continue to write, continue to publish, and disseminate all the information freely with anyone who is interested in learning more about EAPs, uh, expanded access, or other options uh, for people um, living with ALS or other diseases. We're also working on producing a few short videos to explain some critical topics. Um, for example, what is expanded access? Who qualifies for it? What are the other options for PALS? I mean, uh, you, you ask a great question about right to try. That's a different path uh, that's um, not regulated by the FDA, as you correctly stated. Every path has its own drawbacks, uh, you know, pros and cons. And so we want to sh share these videos to make sure that everyone understands the pros and cons of every method and every approach. Uh, the expanded access allows us to monitor the safety uh, of, the, of the drugs. Uh, and that's important because we do need to learn more about these drugs which are not approved yet. Um, so again, we're producing these videos. We have longer webinars. Some of them have already happened and they're posted already on the NILS website. But, uh, but the idea is to, uh, um, to raise awareness about these paths and also share more with everyone who might be interested. We're also linking to other resources. That's an example on the slide. Uh, and, and I do want to mention that there's already a lot of excellent material available online. So we want to create and sort of unify all these resources so that to, to make them very practical and intuitive for people living with ALS. Again, the, the, the website, uh, the, the tab on the NEILS website is not completely finished. We are actively working on that and we plan on, on, on launching it next year. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge also that many people on the call are helping us to provide additional resources. Uh, we have resources for clinicians because in theory, everyone, every clinician could uh, do what I'm doing in terms of applying to the FDA and, and, and opening an expanded access program for their uh, patients. And so we have, uh, however, you know, it does require a significant amount of effort uh, and planning uh, because you do need the protocol, you need the safety monitoring plan, you need the quality management plan, et cetera, to be able to do this in a responsible way, given that it's an experimental drug. And so we're freely sharing all of our tools, uh, all the management tools, that uh, many colleagues on the on the on the call uh, put together, so that others can um, can decide whether you know that that's something that they would want to pursue. Again, all of these require significant time and effort, and we're really grateful for the grant that allowed us to 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 open this for this drug. On the Healy Center website, we're also working with many of you on the call. We have a fantastic patient advisory committee that's helping us put together a frequently asked questions page. Uh, it's not live yet. We're still refining the context and we hope to launch it soon again and, and link with Niels. Uh, this is all a partnership. Different groups, different um, uh, groups are, are really uh, putting together excellent educational materials. And our goal is to synergize so that this new concept, EAPs, really nobody talked about them until maybe a couple of years ago. And now uh, we want to, uh, to promote it, to support the concept, but also share accurate and reliable information so that this can become really uh, a great next step for the entire field. Lastly, I do want to mention that um, we, we are also testing other drugs in the context of the Healy ALS platform trial. And when we started uh, the program with Vertiperstat, that was really well so well received, uh, again, thanks to the grant from IMALS, that we decided to, uh, 
to do more uh, and expand the, the program to other drugs that are part of the platform trial. So we launched the EAP companion to the Healy ALS platform trial. The goal is to, again, uh, continue to move forward, continue to make more options available to people living with ALS. So as of today, we have three programs. The one with Verdiperstat that I just mentioned earlier is obviously up and running. And then we have, we partner with two other drug, uh, drug companies that donated drug. Clean uh, donated CNM A8 for an EAP at three centers uh, for 15 people. And Prilenia, uh, the manufacturer of Predopidin, donated drug for 24 participants at three centers. The name of the centers are on the slide. As you can see on the map, we're really trying to select sites that participate in the platform trial, also with an eye to, towards geography. We want to make this available, uh, not just in one particular area, but throughout the country. So, um, so I think that's something that we want to continue to expand and has more, uh, hopefully more grants, more funding opportunities um, arise. Uh, we can continue to increase the number of sites and the number of participants and the number of drugs that offer EAPs um, for people living with ALS, not, not just around our center, but again, uh, around the country. So th that was the short presentation I had. I hope that was helpful to sort of take a step back and share the work that, that we are doing. And I'll, I'll pause here. In terms of all the question about right to try, you're right, that's another path. Um, and, and again, there's pros and cons with um, every approach. I would say that these are still experimental drugs. These are investigational products uh, that are, you know, we need to learn more about. Uh, people who participate in the EAP uh, provide safety data and for some EAPs, some limited biomarker data, that's important for us to make sure that we provide access, not just to any drug, but to the best drugs available. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? I, mean, I might have missed this, but I the 35 uh, people that it would, would get expanded access, has that already started or you're enrolling? Oh, yes. Yeah, we enrolled most of them already. Uh, we have a few spots left. Uh, and so we'll, um, again, for, for every program, uh, many people have already been enrolled. Uh, and uh, specifically for very deeper stat, I'm trying to do the math in my head right now. Sorry, I'm a little bit slow, but I think we enrolled 25 or so, uh, and we have a few more spots available for very deeper stat. For the other programs also, many people have already been enrolled uh, and we have a few more spots available. Any other questions? And again, I do want to thank the many people on the call who are also part of our patient advisory committee. Uh, we are really um, working on finalizing a number of materials that I hope will be helpful uh, to the community and we will make them freely available um, in 2022. So I think that we'll really continue to catalyze the conversation about EAPs, uh, provide additional resources, hopefully help um, others create new EAPs. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as obviously there's um, lots of legislative, uh, uh, you know, different approaches that are going on, different proposals, hopefully there will be more funding in the near future about EAPs um, so that we can continue to grow programs like this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any further questions? Hey, Sabrina, it's Lori. I just have one question. In order for clinics to have access to the drug for an EAP, do they have to be a ALS center of excellence or can any clinic that treats ALS patients provide the drug? Any clinic could. Um, and so uh, to be honest with you, you don't even need to have an, an ALS center. Any physician can ask the FDA uh, to start a, a, an expanded access program, uh, whether it's for one unique patient or a small group of, of patients. Uh, and the FDA actually grants the vast majority, I think it's over 95% or something like that, of the requests that are made. I do want to emphasize 
that the, the amount of time and effort that it takes uh, to, um, to support these type of programs, uh, that's really huge. Uh, it's really, um, you know, the, the sort of, you know, to, to make, it's not just a prescription, but there's a number of administrative steps, regulatory steps, and, and ultimately um, reporting to the FDA uh, that, you know, that, that creates a significant barrier. So by sharing some of our resources, we hope to empower uh, other ALS centers or even individual providers, individual physicians to, uh, to do this in, in an easier way, in a more streamlined way. I guess the issue is not only letting the clinicians and educating them that they can provide um, an EAP if it's available, but it's also uh, really educating the patients as well that they can ask for an EAP. So I think that with what we're putting out on the site, we should really highlight that, that it is okay to ask your clinician about an EAP. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, obviously, the, uh, there's no mandate for, for companies to donate drug. Sometimes some of the companies are small um, companies and they don't have um, product available or they only have product available for small groups of, of, of people uh, in addition to their clinical trial. So that, that could be another barrier. So I think it really requires sort of everyone coming together to be wanting to do this, uh, hopefully EAPs will be the norm and, and companies can plan for a formal trial and an EAP alongside that for people that don't qualify for the trial. Sabrina, I have a follow-up for that. Is there anything, um, like, is there any regulation or is there anything that's holding um, companies or medical centers back from being able to share more there and can IMALS help in any kind of education or marketing that might not be or might be prohibited otherwise? No, I mean, I think, you know, as, as you know, Teresa, we, we, we've been um, also had, we, we've had some discussions with you uh, about uh, pr producing some additional materials that we're, we're working on in collaboration with you. Uh, and, and I think all of these, you know, sort of all of the resources are going to be helpful. I think, you know, the, the truth is that it's more time and resources uh, and really the need for funding. Uh, that's the single thing that's going to make the most difference. Uh, sort of, you know, the funding and the, uh, uh, the sort of allocating resources to this in addition to regular clinical trials. So funding, unfortunately, will, will, will be uh, the critical factor here. I have one other question, Sabrina. Do you know for some of these other sites, are in terms of raising money for the EAP, and I know that a lot of the money has been raised by philanthropy, but what about some of these other organizations or um, centers that you work with, if they were to be able to create sort of a like a fund, a repository for them to also contribute financially. I mean, you guys started this, you guys have really laid the groundwork for it. Should there be a way or could there be a way that collaboratively other centers, organizations could also make contributions to an EAP? Absolutely. No, that's a great suggestion and, and we should definitely make it clear. Uh, different groups, uh, different organizations can contribute uh, and that really helps because it enables centers to set aside time and resources. Uh, for example, uh, they could hire a coordinator to do this uh, just with the scheduling or, or you know, making sure that the drug is shipped and received and all of that. So, um, so definitely uh, that would be a game changer if, you know, I know some, some centers are uh, raising funds for that. So definitely the more, uh, the more centers can do that, uh, the more um, slots there will be for their patients. Yeah, it seems like it's a resource issue in terms of having someone to commit to the time um, right. so that it takes the burden off the clinician as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you're spot on. If somebody has access to a lot of money, like say they have millions of dollars in their retirement and they want to buy and they don't qualify for an ALS trial, uh, can they pay for an EAP drug and they they don't, you know, there's not, yeah, can, can you pay for an EAP drug? That's a 
great question. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, I would defer this to uh, my colleagues uh, at the New York Center, New York University. Uh, actually, I've been meaning to talk to Dr. Bateman House about that because uh, I really want, you know, it's a complex landscape, uh, as you may imagine, uh, with a lot of different implications. So, uh, again, I've not been involved with that uh, uh, specifically. So, I want to make sure that I get the real experts to answer your question. Okay. Hello, um, this is Victorino Benson. I have a question. Hi, Dr. Paganoni. Hi. I was just, just wondering, I know that if you have PMA, uh, you don't have the four ALS, and it's um, rare than ALS, we don't qualify for uh, the trials. Um, is there a way, or how can we know if we could qualify for EAPs, or do we just wait until all the trials are done because it becomes a little bit desperate? Just want to no, find out. No, that's a great question. I would say that PMA um, is actually a perfect fit for EAPs because people with PMA have um, a form of ALS uh, that's a little bit different, as you know, uh, and that makes it in makes people with PMA ineligible for for formal trials. So that's actually a perfect um, fit for, for PMA. Uh, and in fact, I can tell you, we have a few people that, that, that fit that criteria uh, because they're not eligible for regular trials. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Any further questions? Okay, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Paganoni, but also all of you for taking time today to show up. And um, we are recording this, as I mentioned at the top, and we'll be sharing this out for anybody who'd like further resources. Um, but thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful start to the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you so much.